Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. It is uh, so wonderful to have such an illustrious gathering of the uh, Yeshiva University community. My name is Yaakov Glasser. I have the great privilege of serving as the David Mitzner Dean of Yeshiva University's Center for the Jewish Future. And our role is to bring the scholarship and inspiration of Yeshiva University to the broader YU community. And we are working, especially now, through the medium of Zoom to bring much more of what YU, what makes YU unique in its values-driven approach to the world to make it accessible to our broader community. And tonight is such a great example because this is a program where it's taking place on the campus of Washington Heights, would be accessible to a limited number of our supporters and friends and community members. But through the medium of Zoom, we have the opportunity to welcome really people from all over the world. So for those of you in the New York area, we're happy for you to join us for a little bit of warmth. For those of you in Los Angeles and Florida, I'm sure that looking at the palm trees so much is very exhausting. So this will be a nice welcome break and uh, really for everyone to be able to gather together for a stimulating and elevating experience of scholarship and reflection. Uh, I would like to introduce for tonight's program, who's going to frame the program for us tonight and really introduce the program, uh, Dr. Daniel Reinhold, who is the Dean of the Bernard Revel Graduate School of Jewish Studies here at Yeshiva University. Dr. Reinhold was born in London. He was educated in the universities in Cambridge and London, and he has written extensively on Jewish philosophy. He is the dynamic new leader of the Revel Graduate School and his passion, his creativity, his dedication and devotion have already made their mark on Revel's growth, more students, more connections. And tonight's program is just another uh, manifestation of that passion and creativity in bringing together so many members of our community uh, in order for us to learn together, to study together and to draw from the inspiration of the scholars and leaders of Yeshiva University. So Dr. Reinhold, please take it away. Thank you, Rabbi Glasser. Uh, a warm welcome on a cold night to all of you. Uh, my name's Daniel Reinhold, as Rabbi Glasser said. I'm the Dean of the Bernard Ravel Graduate School of Jewish Studies at Yeshiva University. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you tonight and introduce our event celebrating the publication of a new book by Dr. Ephraim Karnafogel, the E. Billy Ivry University Professor of Jewish History, Literature and Law. Uh, I won't keep you long since I'm most certainly not the main event, but I do want to just say that the Revel Graduate School of Jewish Studies is a world-class academic institution with world-renowned scholars who are wonderful teachers, research active, publishing with the world's top academic presses, and I feel deeply humbled daily to be heading up a faculty with scholars like Dr. Karnafogel, whose new book, Brothers from Afar, Rabbinic Approaches to Apostasy and Reversion in Medieval Europe, we are celebrating tonight. And I will just say that you're here tonight to hear cutting edge scholarship concerning medieval history of halakha, uh, and to add that if you like what you hear, uh, or better, if you don't like what you hear and you want to come and argue about it, uh, think about looking us up. Um, you can join us at Revel and um, study the uh, um, various topics that you see on the screen before you. Uh, these days, of course, classes are a mere click away. So should you wish to audit, apply for a master's degree, women and men, we're a co-ed school, part-time options, scholarships available, please do join us, friend us on Facebook, do whatever the equivalent is on Instagram, I've no idea I'm old, uh, but Revel is here, it's a real jewel and we're very keen to engage with our communities and to welcome as, as many new students as possible. Um, and with that, I'd like to introduce first a rather well-known graduate of Revel, a certain Rabbi Dr. Ari Berman, uh, who earned his BA from Yeshiva College and his MA in Medieval Jewish Philosophy from the Bernard Revel Graduate School of Jewish Studies. Um, and of course, his uh, rabbinical ordination from REITS before making Aliyah in 2008, subsequently completing a PhD in Jewish thought 
at Hebrew University and his area of scholarly expertise is in medieval halakhic thought with a focus on cases of Jewish apostasy and questions of the Jew-non-Jew -Jew divide, which of course relates directly to our topic tonight. So I, I will add that while we're always grateful for President Berman's support, we particularly appreciate his taking time out of his busy schedule tonight to join us, uh, though I imagine he's equally grateful to be able to momentarily cast off his administrative hat and spent some time guilt-free indulging in his scholarly interests. Um, but of course, President Berman joins us tonight in honor of and to converse with Rabbi Dr. Ephraim Karnafogel, a genuinely preeminent scholar in the fields of medieval Jewish intellectual history and rabbinic literature, who has authored over a hundred articles and written or edited 11 books in English and in Hebrew. Uh, they include his first book, Jewish Education and Society in the High Middle Ages, which won the National Jewish Book Award for Scholarship, and the Intellectual History and Rabbinic Culture of Medieval Ashkenaz, which won the Goldstein Gorin Prize for Best Book 2010 to 2013, which is awarded by the International Center for Jewish Thought at Ben Gurion University of the Negev, the Association for Jewish Studies, Jordan Schnitzer Book Award as well for the best book in biblical and rabbinic literature, um, and was actually this work was described by Professor Elliot Wolfson of NYU as solidifying his status as the leading intellectual historian of rabbinic culture in medieval Ashkenaz. So without further ado, I'm going to throw over to President Berman to begin our discussion with our esteemed scholar tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Reinhold. Uh, thank you for the incredible work that you're doing at our Bernard Rebel Graduate School. Uh, such an important center of Jewish knowledge as we educate the next generation of Jewish scholars who will be leaders uh, of our community. You're just doing such an incredible job. Thank you so much. Uh, welcome everyone here uh, to this uh, very important evening at uh, this fascinating, this fascinating topic. You know, let me uh, begin by introducing uh, uh, the author a little bit and in introducing the topic. Uh, I have to say, Dr. Reinhold, I have no guilt whenever speaking to great scholars. One of the great blessings of my position is that I have a chance to regularly interact with some of the greatest minds in our community representing the greatest minds in the world on their topics of, uh, of expertise. Um, it's, a, it's a joy for me at every occasion that I have, and I am excited about this venue, uh, the Rabbi Glasser is the Dean of the Center of the Jewish Future, and all of the opportunities that he is embarking on to showcase our scholars to our worldwide community so everyone gets to experience the joy, the interest in deepening their, uh, uh, their understanding of uh, Jewish history, of Jewish ideas, and of Jewish values, our understanding insights into the world and to the latest areas of scholarship in all fields uh, that Yeshiva University excels in, uh, which is of course uh, the range of humanities and sciences, as well as uh, uh, all areas of Jewish scholarship. Um, tonight's uh, author is, uh, is someone I have to say I'm, I'm a huge fan of his. Uh, when I uh, was studying for my doctorate, he was, uh, his works were regularly featured in my hours and hours of study. He represents world class. He's world renowned, world class scholar, really the top in his field. At every conference, at every major conference, any major work that deals with medieval Jewish halacha, Dr. Karner Fogel is, uh, is a celebrated uh, participant. Uh, this is important for Yeshiva University in two respects. First of all, for our students, we get to learn from the best. We get to have the intellectual experience of being in his classroom uh, with his range of knowledge. It's just a, it's a huge, uh, huge benefit and gift uh, to our students, and secondly, to the entire university, because we point to areas of excellence in which others follow. And Dr. Karnafogel and the Bernard Rebel Graduate School reflects excellence that we look to as models 
in all areas of scholarship across our university. So it's a pleasure to be here with you. Dr. Carnafogel, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, thank you. So I leave you speechless. It's really hard to follow after that kind of introduction. That's correct. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say we could end it right here and it'll be perfect, but I think we can't disappoint the audience. <laughs> okay, so then let me, let me then introduce the topic uh which is which is large but we're gonna we're gonna narrow in to flesh out some of the details in your work and your scholarship in this amazing book brothers from afar which i have read cover to cover and i have to say it uh is a great example of the scholarship uh, that you bring to uh to the world so uh the topic that we're speaking about uh which uh is conversion and reversion apostasy uh uh, leaving the Jewish community and coming back to the Jewish community, uh, to me, touches on a major area of interest, which is the definition of Jewish identity. You know, we've long, uh, we've long been taught the uh, premise that once a Jew, always a Jew, uh, that if you're born a Jew, you convert according to halacha, there's nothing you can do, you always stay Jewish in all ways and all matters. But the halachic history is actually far more complicated. And uh, why don't we begin with speaking about re-entry. Uh, you know, in, in the thought of the once a Jew, always a Jew kind of approach, you would think that if a Jew decides to convert to another religion and then comes back to Judaism, he does tshuva, he claps al chait, uh, he's upset, he goes uh, nice Yom Kippur, but of course, he's a Jew and there's nothing that he has to do to re-enter into the Jewish community. Is that exactly how it unfolded or, or how would you uh, explain the, uh, the story? Is it a little more complicated than that, Dr. Gunner? Uh, well, of course, President Berman, who has read the book very carefully, we discussed it the other week. I had to go back and check some footnotes to make sure I remember what I wrote. Uh, it is more complicated than that. And that's really the story that the book describes in part. Uh, again, the representative of the sort of once a Jew, always a Jew in its simplest sense is someone like Rashi, who famously took the Talmudic principle or, or uh, approach of Ava Pisha Chatai Yisrael, who even though a Jew has sinned grievously, he remains a Jew. Uh, for Rashi, it would seem exactly as President Burma described. Once you're out, you come back. If you're back and you function as a Jew, you couldn't come back and I'll make a very bad pun and say, keep your fingers crossed. But once you come back, it's a pre perm joke. Uh, once you come back, uh, uh, you're back. As long as you're participating in the communal life, the synagogue life, your Jewish communities are small. There aren't 27 options of where you can buy your kosher meat and so on and so forth. So you're in, you're back. Um, and that was the position very much put forward by my Dr. Vater at Revel, as it turns out, the late great Professor Jacob Katz, who was at Hebrew University for mo most of his career. Upon his retirement, he uh, always said, I'm a very young man. He was about 68, came right to yeshiva, spent several semesters with us. I got to work with him. We didn't discuss it that much then, because uh, I think he would have argued. But Professor Katz suggested that Rashi's view held sway throughout the medieval period. What I started to notice, and I thought about how I noticed that some of it is based on reading the scholarship of others. Uh, Professor Yerushalmi, Yosef Chaim Yerushalmi, uh, Alav HaShalom, who I think did his BA at Yeshiva, we can check that. Uh, got his doctorate at Columbia, taught at Harvard, came back to Columbia. Uh, Yerushalmi noticed, for example, texts, very interesting Latin texts of Christian uh, uh, confessors, people who monitored, really uh, inquisitors, people who monitored Christians who went back to Judaism. In other words, if somebody converted to Christianity, Christians believed they were now Christian. If they went to revert back to Judaism, these inquisitors wanted to know why, how, and it was more than just knowing why and how. It wasn't an academic exercise. And so Professor Yushami, 1970, in Harvard Theological Review, published a wonderful article uh, putting forward a confessor's manual, the records that Bernard Guy in southern France recorded based on what Jews who became Christians and went back reported to him. And he asked them, what did they make you do? The answer should have been, they made us do nothing. 
They, in fact, reported, this is about 1320 in terms of this uh, time, CE, they reported, they took us to the mikvah. And before that, they rubbed us, they, they put sand on us to rub out everything to get rid of every, not just chatzitza, not just something that's interrupting, you know, making the water perhaps deviate, but they really rubbed it in hard, especially on the spots of the chrism where the baptismal uh, oil was put. Uh, I sort of, you know, my, again, uh, pre-Purim way, call it the mikvah committee from heck. It was a very difficult group. And they made a bracha. They recited a blessing on that, suggesting this is a required immersion. And Fessi Roshami writes, and he says, I'm not sure what to make of this. He writes, he says, Fessi Katz wrote that this was not being required uh, 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 by the rabbis. Perhaps it was a popular custom. Right? The people were actually more stringent in this regard than rabbis. By the way, if you underwent baptism, it might have been a kind of a popular notion. You have to undergo unbaptism called mikvah. That's not you know, regular halachic immersion. That's extra halachic. And so Professor Yerushalmi says, I found it. I, I looked through all the medieval codes. I didn't find any such requirement. I did find it in the early modern period amongst the great early achronim. So he says it must have been a custom that became more required. And Professor Katz talks about that. He says in the early modern period, it did become more required. Okay. But what I started to notice is that there were, I'll call it povisham, here and there, even a print reference or two to Jews in the 13th century having to go back to, having to go to the mikvah as a form of tshuva, as Professor uh, Berman mentioned, as a form of repentance and expiation. The, per, the authority who holds that way is someone named Simcha of Spire. I like to call him in some of my courses the best, the greatest German Tosafist that isn't cited in our Tosfot. He wrote big halachic works, much of which has been lost. Somebody published from manuscript a piece where he suggests that this is for expiation. Okay. That's not a popular custom. That's a rabbinic point. Now it's for personal uh, repentance, but nonetheless. But as I went back and I looked through the scholarly literature, we find other hints that came through the cracks. I'll give you just one more example. In Spain, in around the year 1300, one of our great Rishonim, the Ritva, Yom Tov ben Abraham Ishvili, taught in Northern Spain, student of Rashba and other great Spanish authorities, he quotes a Tosfot, he calls it the late Tosfot, which say that a returning apostate must immerse themselves. And he gives a particularly uh, unusual situation just as a Canaanite slave who's released has to again immerse themselves according to Talmudic law. You're changing status. Look at any Tosfot you can find in the Shas. I, I, you know, I, I ask people, not there, but he's quoting Tosfot. So for me, the answer was manuscripts. Let's go see if what we, what we can find. I found this Tosfot, not in a Tosfot manuscript, but in a collection, say from Mordechai with additional glosses, very interesting text, and we were off to the races. So exactly as you describe it, what seemed to be an open and shut easy case became much more nuanced. And, 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 and let's, let's frame this because you know, this first appears, this question first appears in this context. Uh, I found it uh, in the ninth century mm -hmm. uh, in the work of the Gonin. And, and it's important to highlight the differences in the medieval era and, uh, and, and what occurred in the time of the Talmud, for example. You know, in the Talmud, the phrase that's used and that the Rishonim, the Gonim uh, speak about that uh, Dr. Karnafogel talks about is Meshumat. Meshumad in the Talmud is used to describe a whole range of Jews who transgress either very specific sins on a continuous basis to uh, being idol worshipers. Uh, but in the medieval era, a new concept uh, came about, which is those Jews who converted to other monotheistic faiths. It's a whole new concept of converting to another monotheistic faith to Islam or to Christianity. And what happens when you convert? What happens to your status? And what happens when you come back as uh, Dr. Karnafo was talking about? What I saw in the Gaonim, in the Chuban and the Gaonim, they record this kind of uh, uh, question about a requirement 
to does the does the convert who comes back does he need to go to the mikvah? Uh, do you even give him some type of uh, rabbinic lashes? Uh, does he have to undergo some type of of painful exercise to reemerge as part of the Jewish community? And the Gaonim, which is again ninth century modern day Iraq, uh, pretty much. Uh, respond in unison that this is not a halachic uh, concept, that mikvah is for, uh, is when you convert a non-Jew to a Jew. What does this have to do with somebody who was born a Jew who was coming back into the Jewish community? It seems like it was very amami. It could even have been mystical, the sense that if you violate Averot, if you're living the life of a different faith, then you need to do something to uh, reemerge in a purity that was deserving of the Jewish people. Um, and, but that wasn't accepted by the rabbinic authorities. So it occurred to me that it's reminiscent of another work that Dr. Karnafogel has done, which is Peering <laughs> Through the Lattice, which is an incredible, uh, incredible work about mystical traditions that appear and are accepted by the rabbinic authorities of the Bali Tosfot. Do you see this at all tied to, you know, Hasidic Ashkenaz, uh, acceptance of the uh, mystical ramifications of, of violating or transgressing uh, prohibitions? Is this, a, is this story at all tied? Um, it, it, it certainly may be, and in fact, of Simchav Shpira, Simchav Spire, the one who required the immersion in 13th century Germany because of uh, uh, repentance, was a close colleague. Spire is where Yudah Hasid died in 1217. Simcha dies there around 1230 CE. There's no doubt that Simcha has some of these considerations as well. And so he's looking at it as a almost a quasi-mystical, certainly a pietistic dimension. But this also goes back, we can start to tie some of these things together if, if I'm making myself clear. And that is that Ritva that I mentioned quotes the Geonim, says the Geonim exactly as President Burbitt says, no mikvah, yes, confession and lashes, and then he says, but Tosfot wants mikvah. And what they're, again, another article that got me thinking here, published in Harvard Theological Review in 1980 by someone named Joseph Schatzmiller, great scholar who's uh, not so long ago retired from Duke, a good, good friend and colleague, uh, mentor. Uh, Schatzmiller compares Rashba, Ritva's teacher, who says like the Geonim, no mikvah, yes, lashes, yes, confession, and Ritva, who says, no, 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 we've got to send them to the mikvah. And he suggested very cogently, ah, what are they arguing about? Rashba is saying, don't send them to the mikvah, because apparently people were doing that. That will recognize baptism. That will give baptism too much power. Mm. And Ritva is saying what you said, but there's no halachic basis for any of the other stuff. For mikvah, I can find this Tosafist passage. And when I saw that, I said, that could well be true, but there's gotta be something more fundamental about which they're arguing. What they're really arguing about is what are the Talmudic bases? So yes, you can put in mysticism. Yes, you can put in pietism, but you also have to put in some law and something else. The Geonim who wanted this kind of uh, lashes or public confession, they're looking at verification. Mm. They wanna make sure you know, sure, the fellow's coming to shul, but what does he mean? And that's not so easy to find in Talmudic literature. You can find it, and the Tosafists dig it up. There's a very interesting manuscript piece that's recorded briefly in a medieval text that we have published from Samson of Sans, who died actually in Israel in 1214. He made Aliyah in 1210, but he lived in Sans in northern France, not far from Paris, a great Tosafist. He quotes a Rav Tzemach Gaon, who says, forget the mikvah, see if he means it. And mikvah doesn't prove that you mean it. If your consideration is mystical or pietistic, mikvah is very meaningful, it's more meaningful. If it's halachic and you're looking for models, perhaps. But if you want verification, talk dugri, make a kabbalah, make a, 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 an affirmation before a rabbinic court. So he pushed for that. That didn't get so much play in Northern France. 
it did interestingly get play, play also in Germany, a contemporary of Sam Sibicha of Spire, Ravia, a better known German Tosafist, just because his book was published in the 19th and 20th centuries. It also sat, these big books that sat in manuscript for many, many centuries. Ravia at one point says, Ka Ger, a returning apostate, is akin to a convert to Judaism, requires immersion, requires acceptance before a rabbinic tribunal. He almost makes the two identical, but he says, whereas a convert converting to Judaism, it's a Jewish court that he's converting, converting before, a Jewish court only meets by day. A, an apostate can make his representation before a court at night right. to show that they're not equal, but that's the range. So, so, so all of these- yeah. Just, just to unpack that a little bit, and then we'll move to other, other topics in your book, uh, other ramifications of this. Um, Dr. Karnapo was saying that there are potential pietistic uh, ram, uh, uh, Overtone, right. <laughs> overtones. He's mentioning verification, which is very important. If you think about the consequences, meaning why would a Jewish community need to have verification that a Jew who baptized and converted to Christianity now is coming back to the Jewish community. Think about the risk the Jewish community is taking. They're a minority community in a Christian kingdom. If they are caught converting a Christian to Judaism, the consequences are, are, are drastic um, for the whole community. So if this Jew is tricking, if this Jew, Christian, now Jew is tricking them, uh, this is a bad, this is a bad verification is very important. And the third aspect is identity, Kiger, to what extent does somebody lose any aspect of their Jewish uh, identity in halacha when they switch to another monotheistic faith? So let me ask you, we're just talking about reentry, but let's switch the topic to something very practical. Um, let's say you have a neighbor and he's Jewish and you grew up with him your whole life. And then he converted in the 12th century to uh, Christianity. And then he comes over to you and says, listen, I really want to borrow some money. Um, you know, money lending is, uh, was a, uh, um, a, a vehicle for Jews, of course, to support themselves in the medieval era. Are they allowed to charge interest or not? Uh, the, the Pasuk says that you're allowed to charge interest to a Nachri but to your brother, your brother Jews, you're not allowed to charge interest to. It's a very serious topic in the medieval period that Christians, certainly in the 13th century, started taking notice with, uh, with quite umbrage uh, that Jews uh, did not consider them, them achicha. But to take this, this person, is he considered achicha? Is the, are, you, is the, is, are you allowed to lend him money with interest? Or is he once a Jew, always a Jew, you can charge him interest and there's nothing, uh, there's no difference. All right, so first of all, uh, in terms of progression of this, I, I'm very glad that you like to read my books because you're a terrific reader and you've figured out exactly the, the pattern of thought here. Once we see that coming back to the community is not unnuanced, that causes us to look precisely at these other factors. What are the things can we see bimakbil, sort of in parallel? And again, Professor Katz knew very well that on the interest on the money lending question, there was a little bit of variation. Rashi is consistent in this regard. He says, no interest whatsoever. A Jew is a Jew is a Jew, right? He's just temporarily, you can't break bread with him in that sense. You can't count him for the minyan, but you can, you also may not lend money to him at interest. He may not borrow, uh, you may not, he may not lend to you at interest. You may not lend to him at interest, no interest. Already Rashi's grandson, Rabbeinu Tam, number of Rabbeinu Tam students, Eliezer of Metz, his nephew, the Re, Rashi's great grandson, seem to suggest that money lending to a, an apostate was permitted. So that was sort of, I don't want to say dismissed because it wasn't dismissed, but that was sort of understood, you know, sort of, you know, it's monetary. 
we're not saying you can lend money to him at interest is not saying he's a horrible person. It's a, uh, you know, again, it's perhaps to show that somebody like that is not a chicha, it's not fully your brother. But the fact is, if you go through the literature carefully, more carefully, there are Talmudic sugyot behind this. In other words, Tosafists don't move without these sugyot. Nobody suggests they do, but they don't just move with a pasuk. You've got to go into the Talmudics and see where you are. And the answer is that somebody who's a, a heretic or not fully part of the Jewish community doesn't, should not be treated, should not be supported to the same extent as a member of the Jewish community. Member of the Jewish community, you must support unabashedly. At the very least, you can't lend an interest to them, never mind giving them staka. Charity, somebody who's not fully part or who's you know on the fringe, there are specific Talmudic regulations, right? The same way that a Jew is not required to support a non-Jew, they may. In fact, they're encouraged to societally do the right thing, but there's no mandate. So that's there. But what then happens is something, there, there are a number of variations. For example, there's the suggestion by some, you can lend to them at interest, but they cannot lend to you at interest. Two possible ways of thinking about it. And this is interesting. They are still Jewish. So even though technically, according to Talmud, Talmudic law, whether you are the borrower in a usurious transaction or the lender, you violate rebit, although that's a matter of discussion. Some split the difference. You may lend to them at interest. You may not borrow from them at interest because if they're charging with interest, that's violating their Judaism. So again, there's this very nuanced status. Others, by the way, especially in Germany said, hey, not consistent. If you can't lend, you can't borrow. Uh, others suggest that you can lend to them at interest, you can borrow from them at interest, but you can't lend, uh, I'm sorry, you can lend to them at interest, but you can't borrow from them at interest because they're making a profit being outside the Jewish community. That's not a very good uh, disincentive. That's not a very good way to keep Jews within the community. So these things become much, again, much more nuanced. Consistency is valued. It's not always maintained. And of course, that will lead undoubtedly to your next question, but I'll let you ask it or any other question that you'd like. Oh, which... I have so many questions, Dr. Carnival. <laughs> but I, I mean, that really highlights, I mean, think about that nuanced, uh, that nuanced position. You're allowed to lend with interest. There's a, there's a pasuk in the Torah. It's a violation. It's not just a monetary gift. Right. It says in the Torah, you're not allowed to lend your brother interest. Right. So based on the Talmudic text and Avodah Zarah, Chav, Av, Am, and Bet, and others, the, the Tosfists come to the position, and the Re and, and others, that you can lend the convert to Christianity, the person who's leaving the faith, you can lend him with interest, but you cannot borrow with interest, because it's not a violation of the Pasuk of not lending your brother interest. But you have to be concerned of Lipneiver Lotite and Michel. You can't you can't right. trick him and trip him up to, to create another prohibition for him because him lending to you makes him violate a prohibition. I mean, this is a nuanced concept of a chicha mitzvos and the Yisrael. Let me ask you a, a whole other range, a series of questions. What about inheritance? Mm -hmm. um, you, you have two brothers. Uh, you know, one, uh, one stayed in the, the Jewish path, the other converted out, and now the father dies. And they come and, they, and each one claims their, uh, their, their inheritance. Does, and here's not just a question of who's a Jew, but again, this was already asked in the ninth century in the Gonim, who's a son? Who does halacha consider a son? And if somebody who, uh, who converts out either Islamic or Christian faith, are they still considered the son to inherit uh, uh, the father's fortune? How did, the, how did that play out in Ashkenaz? So, so here, uh, not surprisingly, as we'll see, there is a bit less nuance as follows. Virtually all medieval authorities, from the Geonim to the Rishonim, you know, uh, before a thousand, after a thousand, just to roughly break it up, um, no one uh, was anxious to allow an apostate to inherit his father, somebody who's an active Mishumid. 
Because, again, obviously, if we discuss it from the philosophical or the, uh, you know, metaphysical issue of sun, sonship, right, uh, who's a son, um, we might come to different conclusions. But the Moshe Dell has a book that has sonship in it. It's, it's Sonship Enterprise. No, that's something else. Anyway, uh, it's a wonderful book. Um, uh, the Yerusha inheritance is purely a monetary issue, right? In other words, there are halachot of inheritance, but the fact is that even the notion that a firstborn son inherits double portion can be halachically and appropriately, uh, uh, you know, ridden around. Kefiha halacha. So here it's just a question: Do they get the money or not? And by rules of hefker beit in hefker, the Jewish community has the right to redirect that money. I don't. There's hardly anyone who thinks that the apostate should inherit. The question is what happens if the apostate has sons himself? That's a complicated detailed question. The big machloket becomes, is this, is this non-inheritance based on Torah law? Is it based on rabbinic law? Are there differences? Now, why isn't there all this nuance here? So again, in my view, as I write, one reason is because again, you can get away with it in halacha, right? It's simply a matter of transferring money. You don't, you're not running afoul of 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 uh, Yisrael, who, right? There's not an inalienable right as a Jew to inheritance. It's it's an economic, it's a monetary arrangement that can be redirected. But the other thing here is, it seems, and there are three or four things that fall into this category where it's an interpersonal relationship involving the apostate and, and another. So whether it's money lending, whether it's yibum, we can talk about that, leveret marriage, even whether it's kiddushin, and even if we assume, most assume that the, if, a, if an apostate betrothes a Jewish woman and she's not smart enough to say no, they're married. <laughs> so where it's an interpersonal relationship you get this variation. In other words, there are some who are quote unquote lenient, define leniency, leniency and stringency, and others who look at it in a more nuanced way. Where the status involves the apostate and a, a whole family or a whole group of people, the tendency in halacha quite reasonably is to take a dimmer view. So inheritance is that kind of a case. It's not just between the apostate and another, there could be several children. There could be grandchildren. There could be a whole family. A similar example, a, I'm a Kohen. I'm a lefty, so I'm Pasal Avoda. I'm not happy to announce it, but I can do it and we get Matnos Kahuna even though I can't work. I can teach stuff. Anyway, um, uh, <laughs> uh, and you also have to be right footed. And I'm left footed too, but that's a Gesugim Bechorot. In any case, let's not get too far afield. Duchening, a, a, a Birkat Kohanim. Rabbeinu Gershon, a predecessor of Rashi, had a case of a Jew who became a Christian priest. This was not conversion for economics, this apparently ideologically, and he came back. He was a thinker and he thought, well, I now want to come back. Can he go to Duchen? So Rashi and Rabbeinu Gershom say yes, because again, Rashi says, Alpha Pishachata Yisrael, Rabbeinu Gershom, already Adam braided that approach. There are a number of Rishonei Ashkenaz who say, and this is, comes in the Gonim too, who say, no, because you're always let back to the, even if you repent, even if you're behaving religiously, because even though Afabi Shechata Yisrael, who he's now a Jew, you never are unable to come back to the Jewish community, but you don't necessarily come back to the full lay, uh, level of privileges. My point is, Birkat Kawanim doesn't just affect you and your spouse or you and your borrower or you and your child. It affects the Welt. And so That's again, so, yeah. So let's 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 unpack that. That's really uh, there's so much in there, Dr. Karnavogel. So meaning the Kohen privilege, um, which also, as you said, Rev Netranaygon, it's already in Robert Brody's great uh Chubot Rev Netranaygon. I, uh, quotes and even quoting earlier going in about uh, what happens when a Cohen tries to return. And your theory is so important, which, uh, which talks about you can't see the Meshumad in isolation. You have to see him in context of the community and mm -hmm. the effect of the community. Um, so let's move to, you mentioned Leverite marriage. If we, could, uh, if we could talk about that. It's a very charged issue. Because let's just lay it out for a second. If you have uh, two brothers, 
Uh, one brother marries, uh, they get married, chuppah, nesuin, wonderful. Everything is going uh, beautifully. And then sadly, unfortunately, um, he passes away soon after the marriage. They have no children. And the wife now has to do yibum, but really chalitza, as of course that's the tradition is not to do yibum, but only do chalitza to be freed from being an aguna by the other brother. But the other brother was a mishumad. He was an apostate. He converted to either Islam or to Christianity. So now this woman is sitting as an aguna because he doesn't want to have anything to do with the Jewish religion. He doesn't want to do chalitza. He's going to leave the woman uh, hanging for the rest of her life. This is a issue of personal status. Mm -hmm. You know, the question of kedushin, the question of yibam, of, of marriage, and betrothal, this isn't just, you know, monetary matters that the rabbis can, uh, you know, say hefker bez and hefker, there's no inheritance. Does, is she chained for her whole life? So how did that, how do you see that issue play out uh, in, uh, in Ashkenaz? So again, interestingly, Rashi famously, Lashi Tato being very consistent says, and Professor Katz talked about it, uh, unless this, and again, we're assuming that the only brother available who can show up is this apostate. And of course, the chances of him showing up are slim to maybe none. Rashi held, Yisrael, who it's not that Rashi didn't want to help Agunot. Rashi certainly did. But he's got his higher principle that a Jew is a Jew is a Jew. So Rashi said, no matter when the person apostatized, whether he apostatized before they were married, the brother, or after, it doesn't matter. He's got to show up if he's the only one. And he notes, Rashi, that the Geonim had made a kind of a more inconsistent, at least in his view, approach. Some Geonim, not all, but some Geonim said, if the brother apostatized, apostatized pre-marriage of his brother, his Jewish brother, right, uh, the one who dies, then there's no need for Yibam or Chalitza. The implication is that the marriage was uh, done on the basis of, not, of the woman not having to be stuck with this Mishumit. <laughs> but if he apostatized after they were married, they were already married, she didn't waive anything. He's got an Astal do Chalitza. So Rashi, in effect, uh, he doesn't accuse the Gaonim, but he suggests there's a certain inconsistency here. Inconsistency here. We need to be consistent al pi halacha. What I noticed, again, as, as we're working around here, and exactly as you suggest, well beyond the uh, monetary issues and even the ribis issues, in the late 12th and early 13th century, three German Tosafists, not so well known, and that was the problem, at least, well, I'll tell you about that in a second, um, in different ways, but yet somewhat similar ways, decide that the brother, the brother who apostatized, does not have to do Yibo. Now, interestingly, they don't think that the Kedushin is invalid. They think that if an apostate was Makadesh, a woman, he marries her, and she says yes, they are married. And mm -hmm. if an apostate gives a bill of divorce to his Jewish wife, to whom he's still technically married, they are unmarried, according to Jewish law. But just regarding Yibum, they come up with this unbelievable idea, and this is in this period where they're starting to rethink these things, that uh, it doesn't matter when he apostatized, he is completely removed from this issue of Yibum v'chalitza. Uh, Professor Katz knew about one of them. His name was Rabbi Avraham Hagadol. That's what he's called. And, you know, it's the old story. If you call him Avraham the Great, it means he's not so great, perhaps. We don't know much about him. Professor Katz couldn't find much voltage. It's quoted in a side text. Uh, linked to the Mordechai. First of all, we now know Avram ben Moshe HaGadol of Regensburg was a card-carrying Tosafist who wrote Tosafot that got lost. If you look at the Mordechai manuscripts, he's mentioned right in there. He's a known figure. Okay. He says, it's very simple. If you allow the apostate to do chalitza, it means she, he could have done yibum, right? Because if he can't do yibum, there's no need for chalitza, right? That's the technical laws of yibum says he could never do Yibam. He couldn't marry this woman. He couldn't live with this woman because if she lives with him, she's a Jewess, a full-fledged Jewess. He's an apostate. Kanaim pogim ba. We have to physically remove her from that relationship. So he says, this apostate is out. Mufka 
min hayibum vachlitza. Again, Professor Katz dismissed it as sort of uh, not the lone ravings of some disgruntled right. Tosafists, but right. he sort of pushes it away. But then we find two Tosafists in the early 13th century. One of them, Baruch of Magensa, the head judge in the uh, city of Mainz, dies in 1221, wrote a work called Sefer HaChochma, a 400 section work of which we have about 27 sections pre uh, preserved, scattered around in Mordechai text in a manuscript. So again, a great Balatos, what we hardly knew. He says, based on a very interesting Talmudic principle, that we're going to pask indifferently about when Yibum Chalitza, when the Zika is determined. The vast majority of Rishonim Paskin that that Zika is determined at the time of marriage. Who's ever a brother at the time of marriage, he's in the group, he's in the hunt. Nisuin Mapilin, right? The, the Asimon drops, I'm dating myself, right? The thing happens, the Chalot happens right there. He says, no, we're going to pask Mita Mapelet. It's a Rabbeinu Hananel. He's the first Ashkenazic, first German Tosafist to pask in this way. And he does a great job. He brings extra proof, additional subyot, uluvahul. And it's interesting because this Baruch of Magensa holds, you can't lend to an apostate at interest or borrow from him at interest. He says, no, he's a Jew. But regarding Chalitza, he is not a Jew. So somebody might ask, well, what about marriage then? Why, why do we count the marriage so carefully? And the answer there is pretty interesting. Marriage and divorce, I don't mean are controlled by the husband in a negative way. But if a man decides to offer the woman kedushin, she must accept, but he initiates, right? It's his initiation. If a man decides to divorce his wife again, she must accept. These are issues, Rabbeinu Gershom and others, but he can initiate. He's a major player. Alitza is not his to determine, right? We, the community, in effect, decides that if the brother dies, who's a viable candidate for Chalitza? It's not his call. Obviously, he right. has to do it if he's determined to be in it, but he's not an initiator. So, and he so just to, to, to flesh out the, these three Balei Tosfa that you found and highlighting this, this major debate with Rashi, right. um, this isn't just an issue of, of there's a lenient school or a stringent school. Right. There are principles involved. Right. Meaning somebody could naturally think, oh, you know, Rashi's opinion, you know, that's a, that once a Jew, always a Jew, that's such a, a liberal position that uh, he's accepting of all, there are dramatic consequences. Mm -hmm. This woman is going to be an aguna for her whole life because of the principle of Afopi Shechati Yisrahu. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then you have Bali Tosvot, not the Knaim Pogambo, but the ones who talk about Zika. Right. Which, which I, you know, I think is very much tied to the Pasuk, Shnei Achim Yachtav. Right. Who's considered a brother? Right. When it comes to Yibo. Right. Who's considered a brother that has a, a Zika, a relationship that takes hold? Right. You know, that's a fundamental question not one uh, that the rabbis can do in court, that gets to this core nuanced uh, identity issue. You know, I want to touch on the issue of Kedushin. That is, that is dramatic. Yep. You know, Kedushin is the example. The Gemara and Yavamos and Mem Zayin and Bet, when they talk about what happens when somebody converts, that he's Tavol Va'ala, he comes out of the mikvah, and he becomes a, a Yisrael Gamor. He's fully a Jew. He said, what's the consequence of being fully a Jew? That if he is choserbo, if he reverts back to the way he was before, that even if he's makadesh, even if he uh, betrothes a Jewish woman, the kedushin is still valid. Mm -hmm. Now, can, there are some positions even with that where that's thrown into, uh, into question. Can you, uh, can you speak a little bit about that? So first of all, I just want to say the third Tosafist, who's the best known, who holds that no Yibum is done, is the Or Zarua, and he says Yitzchak Or Zarua dies around 1250, rabbi in Vienna, studied in Germany and northern France. The Or Zarua says that an apostate is not a brother regarding Yibum. Right. But again, he can wall that off because of this uh, initiation that I mentioned. And just to say, Mayor of Rothenburg, who died in 1293, I call him the last of the Mohegans, one of the last of the Tosafists, he thought that perhaps 
the Geonic position against Rashi was right, la halacha, at least we should allow in the case where the brother was an apostate before they married to eliminate the need for chalitza. And he brought a raya from a sugya lake bavakama about again, what conditions the woman expects when she gets married. And then he says, my paraphrase, but I can't pull the trigger against Rashi. So interestingly, the fact that these three important Tosafists said this did not move the Mara. Now, I can't prove to you that he had all this material. This is always a question, who had what texts? But this thing reminds me. Yeah, to get to, it's also the book, it's good, to, <laughs> to get to this question of Kiddushin, this is a, a real minority of Tosafists, but they entertain it. Again, how far will you push it? Will you push it sort of all the way? And based on the sugya early on in my Sefet Yavamot, a very unusual sugya, uh, again, uh, Simcha of Spire is involved, We've talked about this a little bit. There are some Provencal authorities. I found another one for you, Rav Avraham Minhahar, Avraham Benitzchak Minhahar, late 13th century, who's mentioned in the book. A, a small number try to push it that far. But that already puts you in a very difficult position because that's right. making you, right? And this, by the way, is very much related to the difficult halacha question, but these are all halacha questions, real questions. Er shechazar l'suro, right? If a convert backslides, so what is he in and what is he out of? Why shouldn't we consider a, an apostate like a backsliding Jew? So most authorities answer because there is no such thing as a backsliding Jew. You're kind of stuck in the best sense, right? You're not going back to what you were before. You're going away from what you were before. The Kedusha question suggests that you can make this comparison almost all the way, but that really is a, a, it's a, it's a fascinating minority position, but it's a minority, it remains a minority position. A couple of Germans, I don't know if anyone in Northern France suggests it, a couple of views in Provence and Southern France, uh, again, may go back to some Gaonic material, but it's, it's, it's rare. It's rare. It's, it's rare. Where it shows up, certainly in Provence, Yep. Uh, is fascinating. Mm -hmm. And um, it may not be for the convert uh, himself, but actually, and the Miri records the possibility of the convert's child. Right. And, you know, in, in, in what Professor Blitzstein, one of our, our great teachers, and speaking of graduates of uh, Yeshiva University, we have two yep. graduates of Yeshiva University, two graduates, uh, who received their uh, BAs, who uh, received smicha from Yeshiva University, who won the Israel Prize. Uh, Rabbi Dr. Gerald Blitzstein, Zuchar Levracha, and Rabbi Dr. Mori Barabi Arn Lichtenstein. And they both wrote on this topic, mm -hmm. on uh, Blitzstein, on, uh, who is not a Jew, and uh, uh, Rav Luchtenstein in the case where Brother Daniel came up where he defined the Jewish fraternity. And Rav Luchtenstein points out that there is, a, there is a, a place where the rubber band stretches that it might break. And it may not be the convert, but it could be the child of the convert. And that's what the Miri has, in, and I think it's very thematic in Provence in terms of how they, uh, they work on Jewish identity. Um, this is a very rich and deep conversation, Dr. Karnapal, that deals with halachic history, how the halachic history evolved, the social circumstances, how the rabbis applied the Talmudic text to new situations. And I just want to just end with maybe if you could talk a little bit of methodology. Mm -hmm. What is your methodology in studying halacha? In studying these, we've already spoken about your enormous erudition and the way you go into manuscripts. Uh, and I can tell the audience, I've, I've sat in Hebrew University in the National Library. You should see Dr. Karnafogel. He's there and looking through everything. But how would the general learner, the, the somebody who's not going to Hebrew University Library or the, the National Library, what are the, what's the methodology that we can pull out when we study uh, that's important for us to think about if we want to understand the story of halacha? 
Okay. Well, that's a very that's a very excellent final question. But first, I want to say I must say that uh, 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 President Berman doesn't simply know all these things because he read my book. In fact, he has written a wonderful work on Ger Toshav, and I think uh, maybe we'll have a, a return engagement where I will ask you questions about your work because I've read it very carefully, and uh, we hope to see we hope to see a lot of that. So this is not lo bichdi, and he's thought about this. This is not something that he just sort of. Uh, happened to stumble across. Uh, he is an expert too, and uh, everybody should seek out his expertise. Um, very important question. Let me give a brief but important, I hope important answer. So here, I'm going to go back to the Rav Zatzal, with whom I was privileged to study for a few years. And the truth is, I can go back before that to Rav Schechter. I can go back before that to Rabbi Bleich, who was my Rebbe when I was an early admissions freshman at Yeshiva College, who's not a Wayu Musmach. When you do history of halacha, when you do learning, if you're doing lambdas, so you are not technically required to go through everything. Meaning, you can say, I'm going to look at Rabbeinu Tam's approach, I'm going to look at another approach, I'm going to make a narrow argument, perfectly legitimate. If you're going to go through history of halacha, forget manuscripts. It's not an easy job. And that's what the Rav taught immediately. The first thing you did when you did Tosfot in Masechet Megillah is you looked at the parallel Tosfot in Masechet Yevamot. And if you didn't, the Rav hollered because in his own gentle way, he hollered because you've got to try to get the broader and fuller picture. Again, in learning, you can say, I'm doing this, I'm not doing that. In history or history of Halacha, you're trying to develop how this thing, the story, if you miss part of the story, it will be a nice story, but it will be an incomplete story. So what I would suggest, and again, it's not an easy path, and it's not simply read everything, but try to, if somebody is looking at a particular sugya or a particular issue, try to go through a range of Rishonim first to see where the story seems to be going. That will immediately, or should immediately tell you, because the Rishonim you can rely upon for this. They know how to point out interesting things. You will see, wait a second, how come here this Rishon says X, you talk about the Me'iri. The Me'iri has things all over the place that when you put them together, you get a picture. And several great scholars, my teachers, your teachers have written about aspects of the Me'iri's approach to uh, mo uh, other monotheistic religions that are not Judaism and so on and so forth. So the moment you get, so obviously you have to have the depth to understand, but I'm arguing not from a hit and miss breath, I'm arguing from a, you know, radiating out in the circle. You start in the middle and you have to not only go deep, but you have to sort of broaden out and try to see where the consistency is or isn't. We show them don't make stuff up and they tend not to leave things as loose ends. I mean, they sometimes tell you we're not going any further, but that's how you start to get a sense. Have I, you know, as we would say in Hebrew, mitziti or lo mitziti, I've done it, you know, I, I've been there, done that or not. Again, it's not an easy path. That's what I learned from the Rav. That's what I learned already from Rav Shachter. Right? Even high school Rebbeim who studied with the Rav, you've got to try to, I mean, they weren't necessarily teaching history of halacha, but when you when it comes to Rishonim, Achronim, it's harder because they also write more lengthily. The Rishonim are writing very pithy phrases. If you can radiate out, you have the beginnings of at least the questions that you want to ask. So, right. I, you know, it takes a little time, but that's how it goes. It's a real merger between the yeshiva and the university to have Rabbi Dr. Ephraim Karnafogel, who is both a uh, world-renowned scholar and a sought-after posek. Uh, I know personally uh, rabbis who call <laughs> Rabbi Karnafogel for as a Talmud Chacham and posek and the halacha questions, and to to merge all of these, the Rav Rav Shechter with your Shalmi and, uh, and uh, all the scholars and Katz and Jacob Katz, that, that whole, um, the, the whole personage, you know, it's, it just really all, it all comes together. And so I know that tonight we probably raised even more questions than answered and, and uh, you know, enlightened uh, um, a lot of people here of uh, new ideas in the halachic history than they uh, perhaps knew before. And I would suggest if you have more questions and want to understand this even uh, and continue 
to look into this, then look at this book, Brothers From Afar, that I think you can get on Amazon. I'm pretty sure. Dr. Reinold, is this is selling this on Amazon? Oh, yes. It's I'm selling Amazon. it on Amazon. You can get this book. And I am also very confident that Dr. Karen Fogel welcomes all the more than 250 participants who are here uh, on this uh, uh, Zoom event to write to him, to follow up. Is that a fair, is that's that a fair invitation? That's very fair. If you're showing the book, I'm happy to write back to everyone. Now that's very nice. You surprised me. <laughs> I thought my rabbinic colleagues consult with me for my jokes, but I don't know, sometimes they may want something to do. Anyway. <laughs> um, uh, it's, really, uh, it's really a gift. It's a gift that you are, uh, uh, that you're in our, uh, Yeshiva University world is a Talmud Chacham rabbi doctor, and we thank you for uh, for tonight, and thank you for really just the incredible scholarship and role model uh, that you uh, that you shine forth uh, for our students, the next generation of great leaders of the Jewish people. Thank you so much, Dr. Yarn Fogel. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Um, I just want to say. Number one, thank you so much both to President Berman and of course to Rabbi Dr. Karnafogel and Mazaltov on his book and let's send it up those Amazon charts. Um, <laughs> tonight was Kipabayam in terms of the, the immense breadth and depth of knowledge um, that Professor Karnafogel has. Um, other than buying the book the other way or writing to Professor Karnafogel. The other way you can engage, of course, is by enrolling in his courses at Revel. Um, and now we have the virtual capacity. We don't even need to worry about fitting you all into a room in First Hall. So I want to thank very much President Berman for taking the time to do this. Uh, I hope you enjoyed being able to get your teeth into your scholarship once more. Um, Professor Karnafogel, Mazaltov on the book and thank you and thank everybody very, very much for joining us tonight. Uh, and we hope you'll join us at future events or indeed at Yeshiva University at Bernard Revel Graduate School. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Reinhold.